We'll get started in a couple minutes. I'm just doing some uh, prep work for the session. Okay, so about a couple more minutes before we actually formally start. Uh, so um, I hope uh, everyone is doing okay um, after the midterms break. And uh, now we're back to week seven, the first week, usually midterms week here at NUS. Um, so those of you who are local to NUS, if you want to go to MR6, which is on the same floor as my office, uh, you're welcome to come down. And I think the social distancing capacity there is six. So um, if you need uh, help to access that room, just let me know. Uh, and then you can um, join the, the few folks who are around who might want to actually physically be in the same room. Okay, um, let's see, who do we have today? Uh, so I see a couple of us are around uh, so far. So I just wanna check what our presenters are already online. So Peng Tai is one of the presenters. I think that uh, you're presenting, is it the first work? Yeah, I am presenting the first one. Okay, so um, I'll stop my screen share this so you can set up, is that all right? All Are right. you going to be screen sharing or somebody else's? Uh, I'm sharing, I will share the screen later. Okay, meeting will do it, okay. So I'll stop and then you can take over. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, can you see the slides? Yeah, I think we're all good. Okay, so yes. uh, just to let everyone know that again, you know, uh, we hope that uh, you guys will all help out in scribing. Uh, there is a, a, a sign team to scribe the notes. And I, I hope the support team has come up uh, with the lecturing staff for a way of trying to make um, the session a bit more interactive. So this is the second half of our recommendation systems uh, um, set of uh, yeah, talks. So I, uh, we look forward to uh, the free papers that the presenters have chosen to go through, okay? Um, at the end of the session today, we'll have a quick summary of what's going to happen next week for the consultation session four for projects, okay? So stay tuned for that. So without further ado, let's have uh, Yiding and Peng Tai present. All right, I, I'll present the first half of uh, the first paper. Um, yeah, today um, we'll be talking about um, this particular paper called Deep FM. Um, and it's titled the Factorization Machine-Based Neural Network for CTR Prediction. And I, I guess I'll um, be explaining more about what exactly is CTR later. Um, and yeah, let's, I think, jump right through it. Um, we'll be um, basically dividing the presentation into these seven parts, and I'll cover up until uh, number three, deep FM architecture, and Yidin will be taking over after that. Um, if you guys have any question along the way, feel free to stop me, and uh, we'll try to answer. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about what is click through red part for it. Uh, first, um, yeah, basically CTR stands for click through red, and that's a term very um, commonly used in the advertisement recommendation uh, field. 
And specifically for this paper, um, maybe some of you have already noticed that and the paper was um, actually written and some of the authors were actually from a Huawei NOAA AI lab. So what um, in a press release, they actually um, said that they wanted to improve the service quality of accurate, personalized and um, accurate recommendation uh, in the Huawei App Store. And, but in terms of the more scientific specific objective is to um, accurately and efficiently predict the probability that a user is going to click on a particular recommended um, item. And yeah, that's basically the context of um, the research setup. And some of, uh, uh, maybe I need to make this um, also clear at the beginning that this paper was actually written in 2017. So maybe some of the, uh, the, the deep F model is not something that's the, may, may not be the most current, but I do want to um, take a look. I, I don't, if I'm not wrong, I don't think there's like a lot of factory in this area as well. So I hope that, I hope that um, we're not presenting a very outdated work. Um, and I mean, I, I also hope for those who are maybe very well versed in this area that our presentation might be a good refresher as well. Um, yeah, again, let's keep this going. And here is some of the, um, at that time, some of the already used models before deep FAM was proposed. Um, I mean, the more unconventional neural networks that we all we know of is like CNN. Uh, and convolutional neural network and I, the recurrent neural network. And the authors, um, they explained in the paper actually why these two traditional models may not work well with the context of um, advertisement recommendation. For CNN is because um, it will have um, basically be more biased towards the interaction between the neighboring features because in convolution, I mean, seeing them, it, it scans and through by convolution, right? So it will actually prioritize the neighboring features. And that may not be true for the area of, we talk about the features um, present in recommendation because um, it's very hard to actually see which dimension is further from which dimension. So I think the neighboring bias of CNN makes it not so suitable. And for recurrent neural network, because um, the authors mentioned it's because of the recurrent and sequential nature, it might be more suitable for, let's say we have a um, sequence of click actions instead of we're actually just predicting one instance of whether a user is going to click um, at advertisement. So that's why the more traditional ones may not be as suitable. And the other on things that people have proposed. The first one, FNN, which also uses a factorization machine as what we are going to see in the FFM, just that um, it requires, um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the details later. It's based on recommendation. It's based on factorization machine. And for PNN, it's built up upon FNN and introduces a product layer between the embedding layer and the first hidden layer. So it uses the product layer to better capture the higher order feature interactions. And for wide and deep by Google, I think that's the more well-known one because um, the previous works on FAN and PNN, the only, they actually ignore the, because it's deep, it doesn't actually consider the low order feature interactions. So by the wide part, um, and- I mean I mean, and for the white part, I think it actually tries to model the lower order feature interaction. And maybe I need to, I can explain a bit further what we mean by feature interaction here. Um, the, the idea of high and low order feature interaction basically refers to the number of features involved if we are going to predict whether a user is going to download that app in this case, or click an advertisement. Um, so let's say if it's meal time and it's a food delivery app and that leads to a download action, we say that's an order to feature interaction because it involves two dimensions. And if it's a male teenager and it's a shooting game and that leads to a download action and that's order three feature interaction. So just to 
you also get that um, clear. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the specific um, structure of the previously proposed uh, neural network architecture, um, for the F aim, for the factorization machine, I think the major contribution is that because the clicking data can be very high dimensional and actually very, uh, sorry, very uh, high dimensional and very sparse because it's it's where there's a lot of items, but whether the user actually click on it, it's actually, if you consider binary case, it's actually very sparse. So the use the use of FM actually helps to condense this data set to be more low dimensional and also more dense. And that's the, that's the first step. And then it moves on to PLM, which I already discussed, and that it introduces a product layer to better capture the higher order feature interactions. And then the wide and deep actually introduces another wide part, which is the one that we see on the right that helps to better capture the low order feature interactions. And then we would be moving on to, so what actually does deep AM, deep FM contribute, right? Um, and we see here, it's a comparison of why DPM actually takes every single box comparing to the previous models um, for FAN, FAN, I think it's actually a sequence here. We can see that moving from um, FNN to PN, and PN introduced a product layer and this also doesn't require uh, pre-training because FNN uses um, the factorization machine pre-training. And the wide and deep then actually tries to capture the low order features and the DPM actually take his, takes every single box mm, here. Yep. And, and for the deep FAM architecture, it, I mean, so the deep is one part and FM is one part. And so we will be looking at more closely um, in terms of its own architecture. And because it's a binary classification on whether um, a, a certain thing is going to be clicked. So it comprise, comprises of these two parts and we would be looking into the um, each architecture for this one. So the first is about the, uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, the first one is about the uh, FM component. The FM component, it's similar to FM, FN, but it's it's the wide component, right? It's it doesn't involve a deep layer, and I think what's notable here, if we look at the equation on the right, uh, I think the first part would be the first order um, features. It, it's I think maybe we can think of it as something like a simple regression because you only look at that single feature, and then the the right half of the equation actually tries to capture the a product of two dimensions, then that actually uh, reflects um, the other two feature interactions. And I think that corresponds to the graph on the left, the product sign for the FM layer, the product sign um, shows level two, uh, other two features interactions, and the plus sign shows the addition of all the one features. And that's how DPF uses the FM component to capture the low order of feature interactions. And then we move on to the deep component, which um, aims to um, capture the higher order of feature interactions. And, and why this capturing of uh, higher order uh, feature interactions might be superior to the previous ones. I think for the, um, when we compare it to the FNN, FN, because here in deep FAM, I think the trains the factorization machine together with the, uh, with the entire, excuse me, um, with the entire neural network. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually, so it gets trained simultaneously and it doesn't require a pre-training compared to FAM. And if, and the major step that they actually um, did up from the Google's wide and deep is because for Google's wide part, they actually require um, 
like expertise in terms of the feature engineering to be fed into the wide part. But for DeepFM, it uses the same feature embedding and using as the and from the deep part from the factorization machine so that it achieves a convenient um, end to end process that can be used uh, without expertise required for feature engineering. Yep, so I think that covers the entire deep FF architecture and how it compares to the previous models that have been presented. Okay, so why don't we stop for a couple minutes here and uh, talk about uh, whether everyone is um, all together on what the FM is doing and how it compares to the other models. So on Slack or on the um, the scribe document, if you guys can help put uh, the pointers to the FF, FFNN paper, um, uh, that would also be helpful. Um, so maybe I can ask uh, some of you in the audience, um, especially those in the, the graduate uh, component, uh, because you're joining us uh, for the first lecture uh, for the second half. Um, can you guys help describe, uh, um, paraphrase what uh, Peng Tai has described about what should be um, the, how, how does it capture the shallow and deep components? So again, this is a reading group. So I hope uh, you are actually reading the papers as uh, uh, Peng Tai is narrating it, or uh, hopefully you've read it even before that. But if, even if you haven't, it's worthwhile to take a look um, so that uh, this doesn't just uh, serve as background information. You're actually studying uh, the math and um, the papers in a little bit more depth. So um, can I get a volunteer from the audience, especially let's say from the support staff or the graduate students coming in for 6101 uh, part two. No takers. Eating. Okay, then maybe I will try to kind of summarize the uh, deep FM structure. So it's uh, like a combination of two components. First one, we have the FM component, and the second one, we have the deep component. So the deep component, the, the main feature or like the innovation here is that the two components are sharing the same embedding. So there's no need for like feature engineering and all that. And also, the deep component is because we see like the features are passed into the embedding and the interaction between them is then passed through the hidden layers. So that's how they capture the like the kind of interactions between features. And on the other hand, the FM component is more, we have like kind of a linear addition of all the features. And then we have like some of the interaction but mainly order than interactions. And so we have FM component capturing the lower order, the deep component capturing the higher order interactions and sharing the same uh, feature embedding. So that, that's how like deep FM can capture both the low and high order interactions and with the same embedding. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think that's better. Uh, I mean, it, it helps to hear the paper from two different people. So Peng Tai gave us some examples of what are higher order and low order features, but uh, maybe it helps um, if somebody in the audience, again, uh, somebody listening in from the 6101 uh, second half, um, our graduate students can, can give an example of what some order, higher order features are and, and why the, the, the method works to capture them. Okay, anyone would like to give a shot? You can do it on chat. 
uh, you can do it by unmuting and, and turning on your camera, but we, we do actually want discussion. It's not just that, you know, your duty is to present a paper to uh, nobody listening, right? <laughs> that wouldn't be so fun. So how about any uh, ideas from the support team uh, or scribes? And this is one of the key key parts of, of feature engineering as uh, when we go back uh, uh, about a decade or two ago, everything had to be feature engineered by hand. Right, so you had to describe all of these um, atomic features, uh, basically the sparse features that's on the on the slide, right? This part down here. Okay, you had to do this by hand, um, and then after you have these sparse features, those are feature classes, right? Um, classes of features for each type of information you have, whether they're demographic information or click information or temporal information, and then you would compose them together as Pengtai alluded to, where uh, you have um, the composition of at least one or uh, two or more of these different features to create aggregate features, right? That you would either take the intersection through an and or something like that to create a, a secondary feature order to feature, right? So um, uh, the, the key innovation in deep neural networks was to make this an automated process, right? Where your stacking is basically absorbing uh, one or more of these features into a composite feature. And then that composite feature itself can be stacked into a, another composite feature um, farther up the chain. Okay, I, I hope everyone is understanding that because I'm quite worried because you guys are all um, in the call, <laughs> but there's no feedback. So uh, I, I'm very worried that uh, you are not actually there. You know, you're just on the call. Um, so uh, let's go on. Maybe you can ask a question. Oh, thanks. Yes, yeah. please do, Clarence. Uh, so the embedding layer, right? Um, could you explain more about how that actually works? Because uh, maybe I'm not very familiar with that. To be honest, that was the exact question I actually wanted to ask before <laughs> Prof, Prof may actually said we can go on because um, I think I haven't um, gone in depth, but I think Iso actually um, alluded to this a bit last week when we talked about factorization machine, if I'm correct. And I, I, I actually don't quite understand if that's what you are also asking, um, how factorization machine helps to, let's say, condense the sparse and di high dimensional features to a more like dense and low dimensional features then to be fed in, into the network. Now, I mean, sorry, I kind of reposted the question. Yeah, right. Because I was just thinking that there, yeah. there, there is some kind of, uh, in my opinion, some dimension reduction being done. So, uh, uh I'm not sure where how, how this actually works. Is it using an auto encoder or was it used uh maybe like some other methods like PCA to find this embedding that uh, is able to yeah create this embedding layer? Yeah, maybe I can, I can help you to answer this question. Can I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, great. Yeah, so, um, okay, so uh, you guys are having a very good discussion on how to build the embedding. And I think the intuition for the embedding for recommender system is quite similar to the embedding in NLP, like VirtuVec, like Glove, right? So, you know, the, the, the key thing here is to reduce the dimension. Say that we have a dimension of 64, which would be much smaller than hundreds of thousands if we use the one hot encoding, right? So, you know, the one hot encoding would have the, 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 the dimension of one hot encoding would be identical to the number of uh, features or uh, any atomic items you're, 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 you're putting in your model, right? So, uh, um, so, so here's the, 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 the case and practically we generally first randomly assign values 
to these embeddings. For example, the say the 64, right? The 64 dimensions, then uh, each value would be assigned randomly. And for my own past experience, I assigned a, 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 a random value uh, with Gaussian uh, distribution with the mean as zero and with the standard uh, deviation as, uh, as one. Right, so it's a, a Gaussian uh, Gaussian distribution uh, random, and then later we train the FM model, uh, and later um, ideally, you know, if a model is well trained, it is able to indicate that some features are similar. Uh, for example, if we are using some metrics like cosine similarity, uh, two features that are close to each other would receive a higher. Uh, cosine similarity. So, okay. So, the, the, to summarize my 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 answer, so and the the, and the intuition of the the embedding in Rexis is similar to the embedding in 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 NLP, and you know and and first we randomize it and later we train it and ideally, um, a similar uh, similar features would have would have similar uh, embeddings. Uh, 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 yeah, that's it. Wish yeah, I have okay, helped you. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Clarence. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for al allowing me to answer. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, do I you have, do uh, you have uh, more good. comments? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would ask you all to go. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, to study this up a little bit more because this is a fairly basic paper. Uh, it's it's not so modern, but it's not so old to be completely dated to. So it's, it serves as a good uh, starting point for a lot of investigation. So the, the other papers on product neural networks and factor neural networks are, are pretty good too, um, in the sense to give you a, a good basis for that. And uh, Taka has reminded us in the chat um, that uh, uh, the matrix factorization method basically uh, tries to, uh, uh, by, by way of the um, factorization, um, turn it into two component matrices that are uh, low dimensional and um, perhaps much more dense. So uh, it, it doesn't use PCA or any other type of dimensionality reduction technology in, um, explicitly right it's doing so, so uh, by uh, creating a low rank approximation uh, for um, the user and the item uh, rather than the, the user item matrix directly so i hope that uh, answers your question a little bit there okay so if you're on the slack channel uh, you might uh, want to um, post on the general channel a, a bit more um, discussion about the component papers so that uh, you can use um, both of your facilities of, you know, listening and um, looking at the slides as well as uh, using Slack to find the relevant papers. Um, I'm still doing some editing, but after that, I'll, I'll get on that as well. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, sure. And thank you, Pute, for sharing on the model and also Yisong for clarifying our questions. And now I will talk about the experiments conducted in this paper. So two data sets I used here because the writers want to cover both the benchmark data and also the commercial data. So for the benchmark data, we have Critio data set. So Critio is an online advertising company. And in this data set, we have 45 million users click records. And we also have 13 continuous features and 26 categorical features that we do not know ex like what exactly they are. And for the split, we are using 90% uh, for training and the remaining 10% is reserved for testing. And for the other data set, which is a commercial data set is from a particular company. And we have the user click record from its game center of the company's app store around 1 billion records, which is much larger compared to the benchmark data set. For features, we do, know, we do not know how many features there are, but we know the features cover three aspects, the app features, user features, and also the context features like operation time. And in terms of the split, the writers are using seven consecutive days of data for training and the next following day for testing. And so here's an overview of the data set we are using later. And now let's look at the baseline models used in experiments. So we have logistic regression, which is the most basic one, and factorization machine. 
and uh, FM initial initiated feed forward neural network, which is covered by Pai just now, and also the product based neural network. So just to get, uh, like recap a bit, pro Duct-based neural network has a product layer in between the embedding layer and the first hidden layer. So it uses different types of product operation and we have three variations here. The one using the inner product operation, which is IPNN. The one using the outer product operation, uh, OPN, and the one that combines both inner and outer product, which is PNN. And for where and deep is more familiar to you I guess. The two variations are included, the original version, which is kind of like the wide and deep neural network combined. And also to here is a variation brought up by the writers to save on the feature engineering effort. So they kind of change the LR component to FM, so they do not have to do feature engineering here. In terms of evaluation matrix, we have area under LC curve and also cross entropy log loss. I will not go deep here because we are all kind of familiar with this. And also here's some parameter settings. We have a 0 0.5 dropout ratio. Neural uh, network structure follows a constant structure. We have 400 neurons per layer and three layers in total. In terms of optimizer, we have one for log LR and item for the rest. Activation function, we have tangent uh, hyperbolic for IPN and ReLU for the others. In terms of the latent dimension used for uh, factorization machines turn here. So I will go through the experiment results using these um, parameters first. And after that, I will cover how the users have done the hyperparameter study and to decide on this specific set of parameters. And in terms of the performance evaluation, there are two aspects, efficiency and effectiveness. So let's look at efficiency first. And here efficiency is measured by taking the training time of the particular model and divide it by the training time of LR, which is the most basic one. And we can see here the red bar shows the training time and the blue bar shows the pre-training time required. And to highlight a few, we have FNN, which actually is really fast to train but the efficiency of pull down because it has a pre-training part. And the three PNN variations here, we can see the two models that are using inner product in its, in its model is taking longer time. So it kind of suggests that the inner product operations can be inefficient. And overall, we have our deep FM being the most efficient model here. So here's efficiency. And next, let's look at the effectiveness. And before that, just recap a bit on the different features of each baseline models here. So we first category we are, include, we are looking at whether feature interactions are considered in the model. And all the deep models are considering feature interactions except logic regression. And second, let's move on to whether they are learning both high and low order interactions simultaneously. So it's mentioned actually a few times just now. We have deep FM and the two variations of fat and deep considering both types of order interactions. But for FM, FNN, PNN, they are only considering either low order interactions or high order interactions. And last, we are uh, looking at whether the model is having the same feature embedding for both high and low order feature interactions. So that actually this column only apply to these three models, like the FM and two variations of red and deep because they are the only three models that do consider the two types of or the two types of interactions. And only our model DeepFM is having this uh, same feature embedding for both types of feature interactions. And now let's look into the experiment results. And first, uh, to highlight the performance on LR, we can see across two data sets for both uh, evaluation matrix AOC and log loss, logic regression has the lowest AOC but the highest log loss indicating like we, we do have to consider feature interactions and which is kind of predictable also. Next, we are uh, contradicting the performance of the models that do not consider both types of feature interactions with DeepFM. And we can see DeepFM is performing the best here, showing that it's important to consider both high and low order interactions simultaneously in our model. We cannot only consider either low order or high order future interactions. And the last point will be on the importance of having, having a sharp feature embedding among the two components. So we compare the performance of bad and deep and deep FM. So we see deep FM is um, performing 
better than wide and deep for all the data sets and also the matrix, showing that it's not only important to have, have considered to have considered both types of feature interactions, but also to provide a shared feature embedding for both uh, components so that uh, we have, have the optimal performance here. And that's about the experiment performance. And next section will be a brief one on the hyperparameter study. So the author actually explored how different hyperparameter settings can affect performance. And I will not go deep here, but I will give you kind of an overview of what the study is about. So the author considered the few the following hyperparameters, including activation function, dropout rate, number of neurons per layer, number of hidden layers, together with network shape. And the available choices considered for each, including like uh, activation function that are experimenting with both activation functions, dropout rate that are choosing between value in between 0 0.5 and 1, and for number of neurons per layer, they are considering some number in between 100 and 800. In terms of number of hidden layers, is they are choosing between 1, 3, 5, and 7. And for network shape, it's either constant increasing, decreasing, or dharma. So to clarify a little bit, constant means uh, having the same number of neurons every layer, like the one I mentioned just now, 500, 400, 400. Increasing means having more layers as we proceed from the first hidden layer to the last. More neurons from the first hidden layer to the last. Decreasing means the opposite. But diamond means having the least number of neurons the first and the last layer, but have like increasing number of neurons as, as we approach to the middle layer. And it's also important to highlight here when the auto ex experimenting with network shape, they actually uh, have a fixed total number of neurons and hidden layers. So the total number is fixed. It's only the allocation of these neurons in between layers that are varying. And here the optimal setting is just like what have presented just now for the experiment. So the real shows to be giving the best performance. The power rate is something between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9. And two, either 200 or 400 for neurons per layer and three hidden layers and a constant network shape. Here are the two hyperparameters I want to highlight is number of neurons per layer and number of hidden layers. As we choose a higher number for these two hyperparameters, we can see uh, kind of an increased performance on the training data set but they do introduce uh, overfitting on the testing data set. That's why the final setting is actually a kind of a low value here. And that's about the hyperparameter study. So here I just want to summarize on the three major contributions DeepFM has made, and we have actually covered them in other in our presentation discussion. So first, it doesn't require any pre-training which increase efficiency. Second, it learns both high and low order feature interaction. And the most important and innovative addition here is to introduce a sharing strategy of feature embedding to avoid feature engineering. And in terms of future, as uh, Ponte has mentioned, this paper is written in 2017, so it was like back then, to kind of introduce a pooling layers to strengthen the ability of learning most useful high order feature interactions, and also train the FM on a GPU cluster for large scale problems. I think the authors is kind of, uh, want to aim for using DeepFM for uh, real use in commercial industries. So that's what we are trying to achieve in the future. And with that, I have come to the end of our presentation. And if you have any questions you want to clarify or discuss, feel free to either unmute and tell us or uh, can or put in the general chat. Okay, let's first uh, thank uh, Peng Tai and Yiding for their presentation. Great job. So uh, like we have already, uh, since this is a fairly early paper, I mean, um, uh, deep learning and uh, uh, deep neural networks came a little later to IR and then even later to click through prediction. Um, I, I think uh, you see the evolution happening in other fields, for example, vision, then NLP, then IR. Um, so 2017 is a little late, uh, but it's still early in, in, in that sense. So it's now 2021, four years later. Um, so a lot of the deep learning stuff is starting to catch catch up to, to speed uh, on what the other communities are doing. So it's, it's really useful if you're planning to do uh, a, a project in course 
traditional recommendations or recommendation systems to really study these very basic models before they get uh, you know a bit more intricate. So I think that's a, a very good uh, start. Okay, um, Taka asks uh, a question about, uh, and maybe you can unmute and, and say your question yourself rather than, than me paraphrase for you. Yes, yeah, thank you for the yeah, great presentation. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just wondering like why AUC and the low growth improvement is not so, looks not so significant uh, in the company data set. Yeah, actually in the paper, uh, yeah, all sides saying that the AUC improved the 0.61% and the 0.66% in like both company and the data dataset. So yeah, okay, then, uh, okay, improvement rate is okay, similar. Uh, yeah, I, I was just looking into the kind of absolute number of AUC and the low growth. And uh, yeah, I, I was just yeah, wondering the, yeah, because company dataset, the compared to logistic regression, uh, uh, AUC improvement is uh, something like 1% or so, but the criteria dataset, Improve, uh, yeah, three. Well, yeah, three, some, three to four percent. Yeah, right. yeah. One reason might be, yeah, company data set already like, uh, like, achieves, yeah, achieves the higher AUC even though we use the uh, logistic regression. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that to be a, yeah, one reason. Yeah. Okay. I, thank you. Yeah, and it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm just, yeah, kind of, yeah, yes, yeah, wondering, yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not sure about the answer here because the uh, writer said it didn't really cover like why the absolute level of performance is like this. But my guess is there's kind of maybe underlying difference between the two data sets in terms of the size and also the features available, which may result in such kind of uh, performance. And that's my guess here. I'm also not exactly sure about what's the actual reasons for the yeah to your question. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it really depends on the like data set, like mm -hmm. number number of records and then uh, quality of features. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think I can help answer that since yeah. I'm working mm -hmm. for DBFM for the project. I think the company data set its size is around a billion, as Creatio was like forty five million. Uh. And I think that I was playing around with the model as well. And I can really see the more data you have, it, it will, it will normally cause the AUC score and a lot loss score to be a lot uh, better. Yeah, I, I think we can actually um, um, go back to slide number 11. I, I think we actually had something about that. Maybe we didn't make it clear enough because if you see here, actually the size actually differs by quite a bit, right? So we would expect, let's say, the absolute uh, knock loss for the company data set to be a lot smaller than the absolute loss for the crazy data set. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Thank you for the explanation. But thanks for pointing it out, because yeah, I think we also didn't really, didn't really look carefully. Uh, yeah, sorry, may, may I ask one other question? Yeah, uh, so, sorry if I, yeah, just, just missing, yeah. So as for Clitel data set, so training testing split is done by like randomly selecting 90% for training and 10% for testing. So, but the, is there any kind of a, uh, how do you say, the, do, do we, don't, don't, don't we really need to consider kind of a, time series of things. Yeah, like, uh, sorry, I actually I didn't read the paper in detail, but uh, in, uh, usually like recommendation might have a kind of a time series, like uh, characteristics. For example, if I watch like, let's say Titanic and some rom romantic movie, then uh, we should recommend the, like another romantic movie maybe, mm -hmm. but the, how to say, it? but uh, this this should be kind of a time series action by the uh, end, end user, right? So, so usually when we like evaluate the recommendation system, uh, we should do 
like data splitting in terms of kind of a time series. For example, like uh, time t, t minus two, I watch movie A, and the t, t minus one, I watch movie, yeah, another movie. And then the, we should use this as a training data set so that we can predict uh, next uh, in time t, uh, which movie user will, yeah, will, yeah, what, what, uh, will be watching. So, yeah, so uh, then uh, given this, so I'm just wondering if this kind of random splitting is a fair way to evaluate this recommendation system. Hmm. Okay, I think I got your question. And I'm, I, I may not like offer an answer about like my take on this question. Cause when I'm doing this um, presentation, I also notice the difference between the two splitting. Like for the second one, they actually consider the time series problem then they are only reserving the last part for testing. But here is a random selection. So my first, sus Sus like first kind of uh, suspect is that whether timestamp data is available in the data set. So I tried to kind of did a search on this data set, but I didn't find it. So I'm not sure whether they have a kind of a timestamp data here. But if it's random selecting, I think they may be making assumption that people's preferences do not shift over time. But I do feel that your point is valid that people's preferences may shift over time and it's uh, good if we be careful enough to consider these problems as a time series problem and do the splitting accordingly. Yeah, I guess it depends on what kind of like business problem we address and uh, sometimes, yeah, this random split might be good enough, but yeah, I, I just don't know, yeah, yeah. What, what this data set is, yeah. Yeah, thank you for, yeah, answering, yeah. Yeah, so on Slack, I answered your question. So uh, there is a homepage for the Cartero data set. Um, so you can take a look at that. It's uh, on the Slack. And it does tell you actually that the data is time series ordered. So if you wanted to, you can uh, do exactly this type of stratified um, uh, test and training as uh, Taka is pointing out, which is important. Uh, I mean, we've asked this as a uh, part of the final or midterm exam for our undergraduate machine learning class. Um, so it is a uh, time series order. However, the, the, the paper itself, the DFM paper doesn't actually say whether they um, did that type of time splitting uh, when they, they do the the test thing, right? Um, I think uh, Peng Tai and Yiding slide said they randomly select um, the 90%. And uh, when I look at the paper itself, oh, I threw it away already. Um, it, it does tell you a little bit about how they did that. Uh, okay. Anyways, these are good questions to ask. Um, um, in the back of your minds, for those of you who are, who are listening, um, it would be good if you can think, okay, if I see the type of AUC uh, and um, uh, performance uh, curves that I have on, on those slides, can I um, deduce what type of causes there are, right? So in this case, we, we hypothesized that it was actually because the, the amount of data in the two data sets are very different, right? That's why the log likelihood is a lot better in the larger data set because you have enough data to model. Um, but if you didn't have that information, would you be able to diagnose, okay? Because as good data scientists or, or you know, good machine learning engineers, it's good practice to, to, to look at a set of numbers and, and try to sense make from it. Right. Otherwise, you'll just gloss it over. There's just a bunch of numbers, so what's the big deal, right? So uh, Taka went uh, a step further and say, okay, well, they're all a set of numbers, but um, you know, one one is not the same as the other. There's a big performance gap, at least in log likelihood, on, on those uh, figures, and that should strike you as a uh, very perplexing, uh, not in the perplexity sort of way, <laughs> in the human perplexity way, okay. Okay, so these are really good questions and I hope they, they spark your interest about making sure you do your evaluation properly on your systems. And uh, when you read papers, uh, please read them with uh, a lot of skepticism. I mean, it will serve you really well uh, because people don't necessarily describe all of the important points. And because they're trying to get published, they may hide certain things that are uh, sort of in plain sight uh, if you want to look at it carefully. So um, yeah, great. So uh, we did a good job of this paper. Let's again, thank our, our speakers and questioners and all the support staff.
Okay, uh, so now we have our next paper. And um, if I'm not wrong, uh, we have, uh, let's see, Clarence and Shashank uh, presenting this paper, if I'm correct. So um, Clarence or Shashank, would you like to share your screen? Okay, I will do that. Okay, thanks, Clarence. Give me a moment. Sure. Okay. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yep. Yes, okay. Okay, good. Yes. All right, so, all right, so hello oh, everybody. Yeah. So today we'll be uh, discussing the second paper. So, so the title of the second paper is A Novel Hybrid Deep Recommendation System to Differentiate User's Preference and Items Attractiveness. So this is actually a relatively new paper which was written in January this year. So in terms of uh, uh, whether or not uh, the people who have created this have uh, made it very new this year. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so let's go to, let's discuss the abstract. So why was this paper actually uh, being crafted? Was that uh, they realized that, it, that with the fast development of e-commerce websites, uh, things like users' auxiliary inf information, which comprises of uh, things like age, the person's age, the person's in uh, income, the person's employment status, as well as the product's textual information, which includes things like the comments and, rec and reviews that has been given for the particular product. Things like this have been very available uh, for, for to be accessed and for training purposes. However, because um, what we are always trying to uh, do is to create for recommendation system at least, is to come up with a rating score and to be able to uh, propose possible new rec uh, recommendations to uh, to customers who are maybe interested. And because of that, the rating scores are usually very large but very sparse because many of the uh, pairs have not been yet uh, observed. So uh, so this, so this, what they are trying to uh, propose is to, is to uh, use both the user's auxiliary information as well as the, tech, the item's textual information as inputs to train a model to find this innate relationship between item and user interaction. So to, so some of the related works that have been done so far uh, has always been very famously using the matrix factorization for recommendation system. So basically what they do is to come up with a latent representation for the user as well as for the item and to use simple matrix factorization between the two matrix to come up with a, problem, to come up with a rating score for the user and the item. So at the very beginning, uh, so this was has this has been always the the case that has been has been done. So, uh, so what we, what people have been always using is that they are always trying to come up with latent features from um from the inf from the information that they are able to access from the from the items and the and the users. So what they actually propose using is using a deep convolutional neural network to generate these latent fe features. And one of the examples was actually uh, using uh, a deep, deep, deep CNN to find the latent features that are present in a song to be used to, to because if, as, as all of us know, a song is uh, has notes and tunes, but this, how to capture this information was that they fit, they, they converted the wavelength and the frequencies of the different parts of the song and use it to create a latent feature that will be easily trained by the model for the purpose that they are trying to do it for. Yep. So, so let's move on to the aim. So the aim was really to model a recommendation system using, uh, using both users auxiliary information as well as the items textual information simultaneously. So this is a very unique uh, approach where they are actually modeling both at the same time. As, as we go on and discuss further, we will see that actually the loss function is actually a global loss function that takes into account both, uh, both aspects for their training. Yep, so uh, the whole entire model can be broken down into two main subcomponents. The first component is really uh, essentially to predict the user's rating scores. So in, uh, in doing so, we are able to, we are able to possibly predict what, how the user will able, uh, how the user will react to the particular item and 
see if certain items that they have not been exposed to will be of interest to the user. And the next is to really model the, the latent features of the, of the user using uh, a convolutional neural network system, uh, a neural network model. Yeah, so, so some of the key assumptions that have been uh, made. So in this slide, I will, I will refer between the assumptions and the implementations uh, back and forth. So the first assumption that they assumed was that different user-specific latent features can well reflect the user's preferences. So in this, in this sense, it's important for them uh, to want to capture this latent feature of the users. So what they actually decided to do, if you look at implementations one, how they decided to extract this user uh, information was to use a stack denoising autoencoder. So as uh, like what the previous group was uh, explaining about the embedding, this is very similar in creating a soft lead embedding layer for them to represent the user's latent features in that, in that aspect to be fed further or up in the model for uh, to, to eventually come with the rating score. Okay, and next will be to different uh, to they assume that different item specific latent features can well attract different types of users. So in this sense, they are trying to model the item uh, latent item specific latent features and how they actually decided to do this was using a convolutional neural network system. So what they actually decided to fit in as inputs were things like the reviews, the comments that people have given based on their experience using the product. And what the convolution neural network is trying to do is trying to pick up what are the essential words that are being used to describe the particular product by the user. So finally, the final assumption that was used was that uh, users may be interested in different textual content uh, contained in the product, co uh, product comments. So it's, in other words, what it's trying to say is that for different users, they tend to look out for different kinds of words that are present in the comments as indicators to them to whether or not they will find the, the item appealing to them or not. So in this, in this case, what they decided to use was an attention-based CNN to represent this uh, specific item, uh, you, the, the, the specific item latent feature. So I was a, this, my, the, uh, my experience with attention-based system is not very rich. So I actually went to find out what this actually does. And I realized that what it does is that this attention system actually points back. It's, it works together with the CNN to be able to, uh, in other words, provide attention to the key parts that the user, that the user is actually interested in. And this actually helps in creating both the latent feature for the user as well as the item simultaneously for the model. Okay, so I shall now discuss about how the model actually looks like. Okay, so this is actually the, the Dupia model, which they actually uh, created to uh, create the rating matrix. So let me just go through some of the annotations, the, some of the, the notations in this model to maybe provide more clarifications of what they're actually trying to do. So the first R is the rating score matrix. So this over here is basically what they are trying to create. This is the outcome of what they are trying to do. The U and the V are the user's latent factor as well as the item's latent factor. So in the U times V, this is where the matrix uh, factor, uh, ma uh, matrix factorization actually occurs, where they, they take the two different matrix and they multiply them together. Sorry, matrix factor uh, multiplication. Yep, so that is where they actually, they will generate the U and the V from two different separate models. So going deeper into the, the U side first, which is the user's latent features, how they actually decided to do, as mentioned before, was using an autoencoder system. So as you can see, S and S and X are the user's rating score, as well as the user's auxiliary information. So they are both fed from the left side as well as from the bottom into, the, into a stack autoencoder where the important feature that they are trying to generate from this autoencoder is mainly this center portion, which will be used, which will be the user's latent feature that will be used for the matrix factorization in the end. So I was a bit, uh, I was a bit uh, interested in seeing why is it that is, instead of just fitting in the plain uh, S and X uh, vectors, they actually added a bit of noise in the input itself. So while looking further, 
and discussing with my partner, we actually realized what they were trying to do, which was not to really just model our identity kind of function where you're able to replicate fully. But given that there is some noise, maybe possibly because when people input their information, there may be some uh, discrepancies, the, the model will still be able to model an adequate user latent feature to be used for the rating score matrix later. Okay, so that is for the users, the user side. So now as we pan our attention towards the item side, what they actually did was first to run uh, the run the, the comments through an embedding layer through uh, different NLP, using different NLP embeddings such as glove embedding and uh, word to back. And then they decided to put it through an attention-based uh, layer, which as mentioned before, is to really try to find out what are the the parts of the, the sequence that, are, that the model should pay more attention to, which will be used uh, to create this kind of, the create a better later feature for the model itself. And finally, they use a convolutional uh, layer to find out what are the significant features and finally a max pooling layer to intensify the, intensify the, the effects of these features. Yeah, so, um, so this is the model that they have uh, created for the Dupia model. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Sorry. So I shall maybe stop for a while to answer some questions if there are. Uh, uh, I want to know whether the like the the S prime the users rating score with uh, uh the, the noise user scores is predefined or it the target of the model this part of the model is to reduce the loss between the. The, the score with noise and the score denoised. I'm not sure. So it, by my understanding, it seems like a kind of like a similar model of the the decoder and the encoder and decoder part. The first part is like encoder, encode the, the rating score into a kind of like embedding a, a space and then decode it into uh, like human understandable information, like the user actually information, then reduce the loss between the 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 the, the pre part and the post parts. Uh, but 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 I, but I do not quite get why the 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 first half of the hidden layer and the second half of hidden layer all need the input from X, the user auxiliary information. I do not quite get that. Can you simply explain it? So uh, your question is why do they require the the X as the auxiliary information? Is that right? Yeah, okay. and I also not quite sure the what the denoised information here means. Okay. Okay. Uh, so basically, what's happening here? Uh, two things. One about the noise. Uh, S and X are actually uh, S is a vector that shows the user's interaction with various items and how they rated it. And X is basically uh, a representation of the, the additional information you have about the user. So in the, what, what essentially they're doing is that they sample uh, in, from a normal distribution with small mean invariance, some noise, and they add it to the vector manually at the start. Uh, and then they chain it uh, against S prime, X prime, which are uh, without noise. So that is about what they're doing. Um, to use a denoise not to encode. The second thing I want to add is that uh, there's, there's also a stack denoising auto encoder. So what that essentially means is that each of the layers in the autoencoder is actually an autoencoder. So um, what happens is that it takes the output from the previous layer and uh, it chains only one layer at a time. So every layer acts as an encoder. And then once it's, it has been chained, uh, the I plus the next layer, the I plus one layer, will take the output of the previous layer as input. So there's actually uh, uh, some discussion about this later in the presentation as well, uh, but that is uh, essentially what's happening. So you supply both, uh, you supply the user's auxiliary information at each stage, and also the reconstructed output from the previous layer. Does that answer the question? Uh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, so it seems like use the users' uh, auxiliary information to like filter the 
uh, the, the noise from the rating scores. So, so uh, last question is this module is like to use for pre-train the user's latent factor or like co-train with the, the, the other part? Uh, it's going to be trained together. So it, uh, we discussed the, there's a global optimization function which we'll discuss uh, right after this. It's both the components are trained together. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Jan, should I continue from here? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, can I just uh, ask if you're able to see my slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Doris. So basically what we've seen so far uh, from, uh, from the discussion so far is that you have uh, the model and we've uh, talked about how we have, uh, we are seeing the ratings matrix as the interaction of two uh, distinct uh, latent factors for one each for a user and an item. Uh, now I want to discuss more about how this uh, all comes together and how they train the model. So as Clarence mentioned, there's two parts in this. One uh, is uh, that we want to develop some uh, we want to basically develop sort of a compressed representation from the middle layer of the autoencoder, which, uh, which, in, uh, which has, which contains enough information from both the user's latent information and, uh, sorry, the user's auxiliary information as well as their explicit ratings, and then we want to supply that into uh, the model. And simultaneously, we also want to fetch some. Uh, a sort of uh, feature vector from the reviews that we have for each item. And then we want to use these together uh, to actually get the ratings uh, matrix. So uh, basically, if you uh, look at it very simply, what we have is a, a, set, a matrix U with all the vectors for the users. Supposing we assume a dimension D for the latent vectors, uh, we now have a D cross N matrix for the users. And if for M, M number of items, we have a D cross M matrix. And we want to approximate R as U transpose V. So this is kind of similar to what Taka said in the chat earlier about uh, trying to represent a sparse ratings matrix as the product of two smaller uh, yeah, matrices. So uh, in that case, what happens is that um, the authors have chosen to model the joint distribution uh, in, uh, as a um, normal distribution. So uh, for example, what, uh, how they actually write out the conditional distribution, just to remind people uh, what they stand for, R, the rating matrix, U, the user information, and B, the uh, item information, is basically that um, they represent it as a uh, normal distribution uh, with a mean around the dot product of the relevant user and item vectors as a chosen variance. And then they have an indicator flag here and this indicator flag is essentially, uh, this indicator flag is essentially just to say whether or not the user has actually interacted with this product. So it will be a zero or one, which will reduce the term in product to its own value or, it's a, uh, or just a one. Yeah. So that's the intention here. So they model, uh, model the joint distribution this way. Um, so far, uh, are there any questions? Uh, because from now I'll start going into separately uh, the two submodels uh, to discuss how um, they come together. Okay, shall I continue? Okay. Uh, so, uh, as Clarence mentioned, uh, to model the user's preferences, uh, we, uh, we use what is the stack the non auto encoder. I just discussed this a uh, few minutes ago, so I'll go over this really quickly. Um, they take this, uh, these vectors S and X and try to re reconstruct them in S prime and X prime. And so what we're really looking is uh, um, exactly like what was mentioned uh, just now, that this actually resembles an encoder decoder architecture. So we can start of, sort of start thinking of this as a simple autoencoder with, um, with the layers H1 to HL by two performing sort of the role of an encoder and the rest the role of a decoder. Okay. So once we do that, um, if we sort of look at uh, a function uh, G, S, uh, G of S, X, X, X as sort of uh, summarizing the encoder, 
the decoder acts on top of it. So really what happens now is that when you do the forward propagation, you are able to get the value of the tensor at any hidden layer by uh, just using the, uh, the weights coming in from the previous layer and the value of the previous hidden layer. And along with this vector V um, times the user's auxiliary information, and then you have a bias. So on top of all of that, you have the activation function uh, at each level as well. So, uh, so this essentially, sorry, uh, this basically is the function of the encoder acting on the entire data. So um, this essentially becomes the role of, um, uh, this actually becomes what is happening during forward propagation. So, which means that from any of the other half of the stages, we can directly estimate S prime and X prime uh, by just using the uh, just using the weight and the hidden layer value and applying the decoder on top of it, uh, along with the appropriate bias, which will then give us either the uh, estimated S prime or the estimated X prime. Yeah, so this is sort of a blow by blow of how the, the forward propagation works. Yeah. Okay, so that's about the uh, that's about the stage. And the interesting thing to note is that as this model changes, uh, we will be left with um, these representations here, HL by two, which will be useful later for us to put together the global loss function. Uh, now we're going to look at the other uh, half. Sasha, I think there was a question by Taka. He was asking why is it that they use a denoising autoencoder instead of a normal autoencoder? Okay, yeah, so this is actually. Uh, it's slightly hazy in my mind as well, but um, what, what I can think of is that uh, the only reason they actually specify explicitly in the paper, and I actually look for this, is that they say they, uh, they, want, they want to make sure, uh, they want to allow the autoencoder to learn more than just it's an identity function, and they want it to be able to infer from noisy data. So that's uh, as much as I understood from the paper, but uh, if anyone else has uh, a more sure understanding of why they use the demo, so like, like I think my interpretation of it is that, you know, sometimes when people put in their own information, there tends to be things that are either not filled out or filled out wrongly. So, you know, what those things are because your training data. So it adds sort of um, unintended noise in your data. So what this autoencoder is trying to do is to clean having cleaned the, the S prime and the X prime is to be able to see if we are still able to generate a good enough latent feature given that some of these features may be a bit uh, noisy in a sense. Yep. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your explanation. Yeah, actually I was, I'm also like ch checking some like uh, internet search and uh, yeah, I found somebody is, yeah, saying so like, yeah, sometimes the feature is kind of a, not accurately sometimes it's missing yeah due to some like a user profile information yeah it uh, um, oh. missing so yeah but by adding a noise for building a model then even though data is yeah sometimes missing yeah model can like acquire like uh, run the uh, like a uh, appropriate representation yeah okay yeah Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, The other thing I can think of is that quite often the S vector is uh, might be estimated or at least augmented by implicit feedback, which may not be very uh, accurate. So that might be another reason to expect noise. Okay, uh, shall I I'll continue. Okay. Uh, so far, the second half of the model. Uh, this is something Clarence already talked about, so I'll go over a bit faster. Um, what, what the author really says is that they use um, a convolutional neural network because uh, they want to be able to assign different weights to different terms in the reviews. Uh, to clarify, they are working with the, uh, the reviews that are written either about the products on the Amazon data set or for the movies in the movie lens data set. Uh, the idea really is to uh, is that they do uh, quite a bit of pre-processing and then they take each review to be a document or they combine reviews to create a review document for each movie. And then they're able to uh, apply this uh, text-based approach on that. 
So uh, here are the two of the conservations they describe in the paper, and they only mention this in passing, but uh, they say that users may be interested in different parts of the reviews, and so the, they use a CNN that's able to uh, assign different weights to different terms, and, and given this difference in importance, they also use a tension mechanism. And uh, since it's already been discussed, I will just uh, go over how they mathematically model it, and, uh, they can move on. So in essence, basically, suppose they say, uh, take a window of tones, PI, which basically goes from PI plus a negative offset to PI plus a positive offset, PI being the term in between. This now represents a window of tones. Um, they want to assign, uh, they basically want to assign in, uh, a term importance. So uh, what they do here is that um, this uh, matrix is the attention contains the way attention weights, and uh, by by combining uh, by taking product with the window of terms, they are actually able to weight the uh, weight each term uh, along with whatever is the expected attention weight, and they have a bias and an acquisition function. So then they have each word vector. So they use a pretend word embedding. They mentioned love. Uh, so they use a pre-trained word embedding. So they start by initializing it that way. And uh, what they do is that they multiply the word vector with the important score to get a weighted word vector. So, um, ultimately, it comes down to the fact that uh, once they've done this, they have uh, they are able to then generate a feature uh, uh, by taking the entire document, uh, which is the review, and uh, Using the weighted word vectors they have so far, and one, uh, and now they have a bunch of channels and outputs for each. So they use max pooling to get one output, uh, have an output layer where they get uh, the feature out. So if I go back to this diagram here, uh, they've used embeddings. They have the attention layer, they then perform the actual convolution. And then across the channels, they do max pooling and they come up with one latent vector. This latent vector then is expected to convey the information, uh, the text-based information from the reviews. So this is supposed to be the information that we have about the item. So this part actually uh, becomes uh, more involved. So I'm going to go over this very quickly. But the basic idea is that this is the original probability distribution that we started with for the rating matrix. Um, you remember that we represented it as two uh, products uh, or a normal distribution centered over the dot product of the relevant vectors from the user and item matrices. So what they do is that uh, they basically now go back to the model and they instead replace um, the they instead replace uh, they are able to plug in the the condition distributions we have for U and V now from a model. And the idea is that now they, they have a distribution that they are able to infer what information they want about U from this um, compressed vector from the auto encoder, about V from the latent vector. So if you see now we have these terms involved in the distribution. And after this, what happens is that they plug these into the original probability distribution and um, uh, this is basically how they come up with the loss. So this is uh, they, from what I can understand, uh, what they've done is that they've uh, plugged this in, then they've taken uh, the log likelihood and they've tried to uh, maximize the log likelihood. So they seem to be using the MAP method to estimate the parameter uh, estimates. So they end up, uh, so I, I I am not entirely sure of how they work out each of the terms in the loss function, but uh, this is this is uh, this is what they seem to be doing uh, at a high level. So once they have the global loss function, they are then able to come uh, put the model together and set up the experiment. So uh, so they start with the data sets we discussed already. One thing to note is that they have a few sub data sets within the Amazon data set, for example. And some of these have high sparsity as compared to others. So for example, you can notice here that the AIV dataset or the Amazon Instant Video dataset 
uh, actually has a much lower density as compared to the rest. So they are able to compare models and how they perform with varying degrees of sparsity as well. Uh, so they do some basic pre-processing. So they uh, discard some items that don't have enough information, discard users who are too sparse, and uh, do the usual one-hot encoding for all the auxiliary information. And for, for the movies, they also try to collate the top three tags that users have labeled on each movie so that they have some labels uh, against uh, each movie as to what type they may be. So one example can be that a movie may be labeled as a drama. Yeah. Uh, so for the reviews, they do the usual text-based ones. They cut off the, they set a maximum length, they stem the words, and they use a document frequency to, a, to uh, discard anything with a, anything above a threshold of 0 0.5. So this way they end up with a roughly 8,000 word vocabulary. And uh, then they uh, go over the model. The evaluation metric they use is actually a root mean squared error. So a relatively simple way of making sure that they are able to compare uh, compare the predicted ratings matrix. Yeah. So the experiments were averaged five times and the results they uh, noted were that first observation is that they directly showed an improvement across all the data sets. Uh, so these are actually different sizes of the data sets. Um, so 100K, 1 million and 10 million are reference to how many user item interactions there are in that data set. So, uh, so they've shown a significantly higher improvement over the in the AIB data set, almost 12% over the uh, over the other uh, baseline models they consider. Uh, and one of the reasons they suggest uh, is that one of the reasons they suggest for this is that this particular approach, since it's using auxiliary information about both the users and the items, is less susceptible to sparsity problem and the cold start problem. So that is one of the conclusions here. So uh, apart from that, there's one other interesting uh, yeah, there's one other interesting result that they share. So I know this slide looks a bit overwhelming at first, but essentially what they've done is that they've identified some of the key traits. They've identified two users at random, and they've taken two movies of the same category drama. And they've selected these movies such that one user has rated it highly and the other user has rated the movie low. So they selected it. And the, for the second movie, the order is inverted. So for example, the first user gave a rating of five for movie A and two for movie B. Uh, the second user has rated them in the other order. And they try to see, uh, they try to understand that even though these movies were both labeled as drama, if they try to highlight words by their important scores, they understand that these movies with very similar labels and uh, very similar labels and metadata actually come up with very different set of important words. So movie two, for example, happens to be a movie that has to do with something to do with uh, uh, cops and there is an element of death or danger and escape. Whereas the first one seems to be more about marriage, romance, and so on. So, Essentially, basically, the hypothesis they're testing here is that uh, different people react to uh, different people basically react to movies in the same class differently, and that they are able to capture some of the reasons why that happens by looking at this sort of text-based information, which otherwise would not be possible. Yes, yeah, so this is basically for them to establish a reason as to why uh, the information they gathered about the items is useful. So, in conclusion. Uh, they, they were able to propose a new model where they discuss separately the importance of items and uh, the user's preferences and models them separately. And they are also able to show improvement on most state-of-the-art uh, models that are used for such recommendation systems. So that's my presentation and I would like to open up for any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Clarence and Shashank. So uh, let's give them both a round of applause first. Okay, and I hope many of you uh, who haven't had a chance to ask questions will, will ask a question. Uh, Afrin, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, um, please go ahead. The paper mentioned that for the items review, they set a the maximum length of the raw documents to 300, right? Like, I get stemming is used to reduce the vocabulary size, but isn't, I guess the first thing in my mind is that uh, 
the attention based CNN doesn't really handle long sequences of documents well. So uh, that's sorry, why. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Am I breaking up? Uh, yeah. A little bit, but now I can understand the case more. Okay, okay. Uh, like, so I'm guessing the reason why they set the maximum length to just to, to, to something small is to make sure the CNN uh, works well. But like, isn't that really uh, getting rid of potential, uh, I guess, uh, uh, like information that could be used for to, to make the model better? Okay, uh, yeah. I want to say two things here. One, uh, this is not based on uh, what the authors of this paper have done, but in what I've seen before, uh, generally when people model freeform text-based approaches uh, to try to generate vectorized representations, they, there is usually a cutoff for max length. The reason is because even though in some cases you're losing some semantic information, uh, if suppose you choose the maximum length that something to do, something say 98 percentile of the length of text in your data. Uh, you're losing data for a small number of items, but on the other hand, uh, the size of your model reduces considerably. I say that those scale better for the rest. So that might be one of the reasons they considered it. Uh, second thing I think is because uh, th in this particular case, uh, for large text, in, because the idea was to generate just a latent representation. One other assumption might have been that um, a 300-word limit, for example, is able to sufficiently capture most of the important words required for the attention model to work, if that makes sense. Uh, but these are my best guesses. These are not actually drawn from the paper. Yeah, I oh, know, that makes sense. I was wondering whether like, replacing the model using a transformer would help with increasing a length or something. Yeah. Okay, so I can try to answer a little bit of that. So the the minimum length, the maximum length with the raw documents that I pasted on Slack is limited to a three hundred words in the reviews. Um, this is usually because we think uh, comment documents are a little bit like news in the sense that the most important parts of any comment come at the beginning of the comments. So um, when you get really long comments, especially in social media reviews, they tend to be spam, you know, like uh, click on this URL, you know, this is uh, just putting a bunch of keywords so that the search engine will index it and, and display it as a, a useful review when it's not. So that's all the keyword stuffing that happens. Um, as for stemming, it's actually, of course, not related to uh, the, the maximum length in the CNN itself. So uh, a CNN uh, for text only operates over a much smaller window. It usually doesn't op operate over 300, right? It may operate over um, a window of five or seven words, and then you slide this one-dimensional convolution over the entire document. So uh, a CNN usually will look at, let's say, the first five words, and then slide over maybe two words, and then look at the next five words, etc. And uh, this builds up to a, a representation of the document uh, through the levels of uh, hidden layers, right? So the first hidden layer is looking at a very uh, small context of maybe five or seven words. And then uh, the next layer up, because it's composing several of the basic CNN outputs from the first layer, will be able to have a larger resolution. So maybe looking at, let's say, 25 words. And uh, through, through using the ReLU um, or, or whatever activation function that they're looking at, they have um, you know, some, some type of a signal over that entire uh, span of words. So I'm not sure whether that helps a, a little bit uh, more. No, yeah, that helps a lot. Thanks, Ralph. Sure. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, how do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, yeah, sure. So I want to ask, like, for the items, like, do they extract other features, like, for example, popularity of movie, actors in the movie, your release, etc. like, besides the features? And do they, like, translate these features into textual information? Then they like maybe append it together with the review before fitting it into the model. Yeah. My understanding is they are just basing it on the pure comments that people have made. So because I think the assumption is that uh, based on the comments, right, you are able to sort of get the sense of what the specific users have, the, the how they feel towards different uh, movies and the diversity in how different users treat different movies are the thing that they are a key assumption that they have. 
And it was shown in the last experiment where they showed how two different movies in the same genre that has been identified to be uh, one, uh, two different movies that's been identified where one user rated it very high and the other user rated it very low. And how the attention-based CNN was able to still capture what are the significant things that the user particularly is attracted to. Right, so I think with all this, like with this assumption base, right, they felt that the comments alone was sufficient in being able to capture this kind of user item interaction for the example for the movie Lens Data Set. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add here that uh, uh, when, when they discuss how they use this model on the Amazon data set, for example, they take product descriptions along with the reviews. So a lot of the information like that, uh, that you'd expect for a movie can also be presented like about the actors and uh, the studio or the year of release, all of this can also be presented as free form text in the form of a description, which can be like put, uh, inserted into the model without any modification. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so just to be clear also, um, the, the approach does use user side information, right? That, so that's a, a very key part of the way they represent users. Uh, but for the item representation, they're pretty much using just the review information, right? From yeah. that's what I understand. Yeah, uh, like it's uh, not Shang just. Said, uh, yeah, it's go not ahead. Just the, it's not just the reviews. The the paper says that they do take product descriptions, uh, summaries, and reviews. But it seems to me primarily that most of the information they have. Uh, about these products was from the reviews. So es essentially their conclusions uh, had to be drawn with that assumption. But I don't think that there is any modeling constraint that restricts them from using just a description or a summary. Okay, I, I think uh, the scribes can go look and, and see whether um, we have that correctly because it does say uh, like Shashank uh, mentioned uh, in section 4.1, that the Amazon data set has uh, both users' ratings and product reviews. Um, uh, of course, both of those pieces of information are, are needed. Uh, it does say, you know, the user's auxiliary information is included. Um, but we're now talking about the, the content-based uh, attributes of either movies or products, right? So these are um, pieces of information on the item. Uh, rather than pieces of information on the the um, users, okay. yeah, I yeah, actually okay. don't see see all of that there. But uh, never mind. Um, do you guys understand the loss function? I know uh, Shashank uh, presented it, and there's a lot of terms in there. But are you able to map all the terms that uh, are in the loss function back to uh, what uh, terminology that they're using? Uh, Anyone want to discuss that or everything's clear there? Uh, should I just uh, go in quickly? I think in the interest of time, we, we should probably go ahead. I just wanted to double check whether anyone had any okay. problems with that. Uh, I'll try to put a, uh, some uh, explanation of this in the Skype notes. Okay. All right, thanks, Shashank. So um, thank let's again thank Clarence and Shashank for presenting the paper. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, do the final paper. So today, unfortunately, I have a, another meeting at three. So uh, I hope uh, we'll get through the last paper with enough time. So there are three presenters for the last paper. So Guan Hao, Zijin, and uh, Shinza are presenting. Uh, this paper are uh, it's a little recent too, and they have links to the all of the parts. Uh, sorry, who is screen sharing now? I I think it's one house. One house screen sharing. Uh, uh, sorry, um, I, I'm not allowed to. Start? Oh, you want screen share? Okay, sure. So do you guys have a, an ordering that you decided? Uh, on oh, how you yeah, I will. I will start first. Okay, so Shinza is driving the, the screen and- uh, Yeah, yeah, he's there. helping me to click. Okay, Thank go you. for it. Hmm. Uh, can I start? 
Yes, please. Ah, uh, sure. Ah, uh, so hi everyone. Ah, uh, so our uh, the paper we are uh, reading is the simple convolutional generative network for next item recommendation. Ah, uh, next page. Uh, so here are the introduction and preliminaries of this paper. So the objective of this uh, paper is to uh, like improve the performance of the user item uh, interactions uh, by using the recommendation system. And the models uh, uh, we have tried, uh, for example, is an RN a model with softmax, uh, but uh, this model cannot utilize the parallel computation within a sequence because it, uh, it, it depends on the hidden state, the host hidden state of the previous state. Uh, so, uh, so the parallel computation cannot be done, which means it will consume more time and uh, to, to, to run a model. And uh, compared with that, CN model uh, can use the par parallelization. So here we have an example of the model we are using is the Sizer model. Uh, and it, it's a CN model that achieve a comparable performance to the RN models in the recommendation task. Next. And but the Cesar models have some feedbacks. Uh, for example, a, a max pooling scheme uh, will discard some important position and recurrent signals, which means we may not be able to uh, uh, get those uh, sequential data information uh, for the next step, uh, next step uh, prediction. And also uh, the softmax distribution may fail to uh, use the complete set of the dependencies effectively. Uh, next page. And, and then the main achievements in, our, uh, in this paper uh, will, which will be mentioned later by uh, Xinzi is the novel recommendation generative model and the different convolutional network architecture. Okay, next. Okay, uh, can, can you hear me? Uh, am I muted on? Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, okay, I'm not muted, right? Okay, so next I'll go through the model part of this paper. Uh, Okay, so by nature, this model used is a probabilistic generative model, a, a CNN model as discussed. And compared to Kaser, which is the model that this, mod uh, this, this work is comparing throughout the paper, uh, it has four key differences. First of all, uh, the author's model, it, it, it can model the distribution transition of all individual items in a sequence, but Kaser only models the final item. And secondly, uh, this model has a deeper structure compared to Kaser. Thirdly, uh, this model uses a, a one-dimensional convolutional layer, uh, a dilated convolutional layer, uh, compared to Kaser, which uses a two-dimensional convolution layer, which is the standard way. And lastly, uh, due to the reason that Zijin has explained, pooling layers are removed in this model. So this, uh, points will be further elaborated in the next, in the next uh, slice. So firstly, uh, in, in order to understand the model, we have to work out the mass first. Uh, so imagine that uh, we have an item sequence of length t plus one, that is uh, from x zero to xt. Uh, our aim is to estimate the distribution over the item interaction sequence. So we propose this uh, Px, x is the item sequence and p is a joint distribution. So to model Px is nothing but a product of conditional distributions by chain rule. So you can see that uh, x0 is the first, uh, first item. So it's uh, Px0 and we have Px1 given x0 uh, and px2 given x0 and x1 and so on. So in this way, it's a, it's a network that essentially it, the input is from x0 to xt minus one, and the output will be x1 to xt. Where xt is our final expectation, uh, the distribution of xt is, our, is what we require or what we want here. So let's compare this uh, formula with the cases formula. The difference is that uh, 
in case in cases formula, they are only modeling a single conditional distribution. So, but in uh, ours or in the authors. Uh, model is modeling all conditional probabilities. So what are the differences here? The difference is that uh, for cases case is only modeling the distribution of the last uh, item, which is 15 here, uh, con assuming that there are 16 items in total. But it, it's, it fails to explicitly model the internal sequence of x0 to x14. But this uh, can be effectively captured by uh, the authors model next uh, it, it's able to capture the all sequence relations from x uh, one to x fifteen or to x fifteen. Uh, but uh, although the cases model is unable to effectively capture all sequence relations, there are some uh, te technical or some uh, conventional way to solve this issue, which is normally generate some subsessions using data augmentation techniques, such as uh, padding, uh, splitting. So each sub each subsession is like uh, another training session uh, with a different input. For instance, we can have x0 and then uh, all padding items, and then generate um, uh, this uh, arrow here means predict. So we can have x0 uh, paddings, predict x1, x0, x1, paddings, predict x2. Uh, these are the subsessions which can uh, kind of achieve similar, uh, similar effect in uh, capture the internal sequence relations. But it has two drawbacks compared to the author's model. Firstly, using subsessions means that it has separate optimization for each subsession. So it, it kind of cannot guarantee an, a, a, a global opt optimization or optimal results. And secondly, using subsession is, inclu is including a higher computational cost compared to the author's model. And now having the uh, mass formula work out, let's look at the ne network the overall network structure has three layers, embedding lookup layer, dilated layer, and one dimensional transformation layer. So these, uh, these uh, uh, I, I will go through these one by one. Let's, look at, let's first look, up, look at the embedding lookup layer. Just like what, it, what its name suggests, it looks up embeddings uh, and Still, let's assume that we have an item sequence of length t plus one. So what this layer does is that it retrieves each of the first t items via a lookup table. Um, in fact, I, I don't quite understand here. What I don't quite understand is how this lookup table is uh, is formed. I think it's not covered in the paper. Um, uh, but basically it retrieves the first T items of a T plus one item sequence via this lookup table. And uh, it stacks the embedding of them together to form a matrix E. This matrix E is very important here. Um, so for, for each embedding is having a length of two K. K means the number of inner channels in the CNN. So uh, in total, this matrix is a two dimensional matrix uh, with the shape of T times two K because there are T of them uh, stack together. So what- Okay, so let, let's make it clear uh, what Shinzo was asking about, like what the lookup uh, is doing, right? So mm -hmm. basically for each item, we have an embedding uh, and these embeddings are, are just simple vectors, right? Uh, so they're, they're just uh, um, vectors of floats or integers. And um, uh, they're hashing uh, those representations into a dictionary or lookup table, right? So it's an order one lookup. So you can say, I, I want the embedding for item number 29, I don't know, Star Wars, uh, Return of the Jedi, or uh, whatever whatever movie or whatever item that, that's being um, asked for. And then you know, basically that lookup table is then returning that vector, right? And the, that vector is being, uh, formed together uh, by stacking all of the vectors on top of each other uh, in the, the network architecture that uh, uh, you see in, in the, 
the, the, the representation of Caesar in the paper. So if you go um, to figure one in, in the paper itself, uh, on the, the left side of it, uh, which I'm just going to paste into Slack. Here it is. Um, I hope that goes through. Yeah, um, on the, the section A of, of that, uh, you will see that they just basically stack all of the, the previous items that have been consumed uh, into T, T of those items, right? And then uh, you're trying to predict uh, the purple row, the one on the bottom. So it's, it's the same uh, setup as in the, the, the related work coming earlier. Thank you. Uh, sh should I continue? Sure. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so um, after stacking all these embeddings together, we are obtaining this matrix E of shape T times 2K. Please remember this matrix E is important for the uh, next, next uh, the, the coming, uh, coming <laughs> notes. And uh, uh, one thing to note here is that in previous approaches like Kaser, it's treating this matrix, inputting matrix E uh, a 2D, as a 2D image during the convolution. And that is the standard way. So what uh, the author's work does is that it is using an embedding layer of 1D convolution filter, which I deem this as the key innovation of this work. Um, but how to make it 1D will be presented later. Then let's look at the second layer. So after the embedding lookup layer, we have the dilated layer. So before going through the dilated layer, there are two uh, very basic uh, definitions. One is dilation and receptive field. Uh, could, could you make a take if you understand both definitions of uh, dilation and receptive field? Or and maybe you can have a cross or some any other uh, reactions if you don't understand one well of the definition. Okay. Yeah. So you can go to your reactions or participant list and then uh, let me uh, knock it off. Okay. okay. Um, you can you can put an X that would be helpful because then we know that we yeah. need to explain what that means. Could you put a tick if you understand or uh, you, if you don't understand, you can put anything else. Uh, yeah, I think the one, two, the two ticks. Oh, there's a cross. Okay, I think I, I, I'll explain it. Uh, so uh, dilation is basically uh, it, it's like it's like because for each CNN there's a convolutional filter, and it's it's basically adding some zeros within the filter to make it sparse or make it hold. And receptive field is is the it's a region that how many it's like counting how many input spaces or counting how many input neutrons neurons can affect a particular unit or a particular neuron. I think this uh this concept will be uh, very clear if we explain it with this uh, diagram. So let's look at the left hand side one, which is the most standard uh, CNN. Um. Uh, it, it, is is blocked here, but uh, over over here there is a uh, there is a convolutional filter which is which has a which has a size of three, uh, which is one times three uh, masked convolutional filter. If you cannot see it, you can check it through in the in the slides, or you can just imagine it's a block of size three. And a com for a convolutional filter, very uh sim very simply is like four four five six go to this. Two, three, four go to uh, this, so it, it's uh, pretty straightforward for convolutional filter. And a few uh, a, a few parameters I want uh, I want to explain in this figure is like uh, R means receptive field, and uh, C uh, C here means channel, and L means dilation factor, which I will be explaining later. So you can see here in this channel. Each uh, neuron has a receptive field of three because three uh, three input uh, items can affect it. And in this layer, it has a, a 
receptive field of five, or two, three, four, two, three, four, five, six, and a vacuum, and for here it has seven. This is straightforward. And in this case, you can imagine that if you want to increase the receptive field, uh, given that this is a very short sequence, so uh, having three layers, three additional layers means it has a receptive field of seven. But if you want to increase it, uh, a very standard way is to increase the depth. It means that uh, if we can imagine if adding another layer, then it's having a receptive field of nine here. But the problem is that having a very, very deep uh, CN can be very costly in terms of uh, uh, time and uh, any other cost. So uh, it, it becomes very, very inefficient if we have a long uh, item sequence uh, because the increase of receptive field is in fact linear here by increasing depths. So that's why they also propose this. Uh, uh, it's not proposed by him, but they also uses this dilation. Uh, the dilation means you can see that here it's still having a dilation factor of zero, which, which means it's now no dilation. The first uh, layer is the similar, is the exactly the same as the con conventional one. But you can see in the second layer is having a dilation factor of two. So it's taking every next two neuron and and so and in this uh, layer, it has it has a dilation factor of uh, set four. So it's taking every other four neurons. So in this case, you can see that having similar having three layers, you you, you can have a receptive field of fifteen. So this helps to effectively increase uh, the efficiency in modeling long range sequences using dilation. And you, you can see that uh, if you add more uh, layers using dilation, the increase will be uh, exponential instead of linear. So that's, uh, that's the uh, effectiveness of uh, using a dilation layer. And uh, here's a blue line, which means a uh, skip connection, uh, which I will be uh, explain in the in next section. And then let's uh, look at the one dimensional transformation. As I have explained before, if you still remember this matrix D, e, it has a shape of T times 2K, uh, T times 2K, uh, which is a 2D two dimensional matrix. But our network uses a one dimensional convolutional filter here. So, it, so you can see that there is a reshape needed. And how to also carry out this reshape is through, it, it first reshape the two-dimensional matrix E into a three-dimensional tensor T with size one times T times two K. This is uh, very straightforward. And then uh, for each um, mass filter, you can see here uh, conventionally the Kesa treated this three times two K uh, part as a image, but in this case uh, we added zeros here and we look at we look at it horizontally, so it becomes two K numbers of uh, one dimensional uh, one dimensional uh, convolution filter of size of one times three. You look at oh, sorry, you look at it this way. Uh, can you understand this? I think it's uh, pretty straightforward. Oh, okay. I, I think you should be able to understand it. Um, so in, in this case, we treat 2K as the image channel. Uh, so there are 2K of them. Rather than in conventional way of case, we treat it as the width of the convolution filter. That's how this, uh, the, this is uh, the filter is reshaped from 2D to 1D. So after learning the architecture, let's look at the uh, the last session, which is uh, residue learning. Uh, so it also uses this residue network uh, because uh, especially for having long uh, range item sequences, although have although introducing a uh, dilation, it's it's still gonna occur, or we're we're still gonna. Uh, face some very deep uh, network layers. So although having a deep network layer, we can obtain high level uh, high level feature representations, but 
uh, as a drawback, is also going to face the vanishing gradient issue for deep network. So it also introduces this residual learning uh, to tackle the uh, vanishing gradient issue. And residual learning, uh, by, the, by the time this paper was published in 2018, it's now a completely new technique. It's been uh, applied in uh, computer vision very uh, widely, but according to what also argues, this technique has never been observed in any other recommendation system literatures. So this is another contribution of this paper, which is uh, applying residue, residue learning in RS. And uh, the approach to carry out the RS, uh, the, to carry out the residue learning is uh, uh, first stack multiple convolution layers together as a block. And then they employ a skip connection scheme and passes the previous layers feature to the next layer. Uh, so the skip connection scheme allows the explicitly fit the residual learning mapping rather than the original identity mapping. So here is a diagram of the residual network. First, we uh, need to check a few definitions. Uh, e is the metric C that we, we have emphasized before. And we have two functions, Fe and He. Uh, Fe means the residue mapping of the matrix, and He is the desired mapping, which is the mapping that we wish to obtain. Uh, the also construct the model in such a way that uh, uh, He, uh, the desired mapping, is basically nothing but the uh, element wise addition of the residue mapping and the original mapping. You can see here is their identity matrix and the element wise addition here to obtain the uh, HE. So we can see that uh, since E is fixed, then optimizing HE becomes essentially the same as optimizing FE. And they also propose two different uh, block, block uh, wrapping ways. For, so for A is wrap each dilated convolution layer by a residue block. So we can see here there's one uh, convolution no filter. And for for B, they also uh, they also uh, wrap two dilated layers together. So there are two dilated layers here, and in each uh, in each block it contains uh, three different kinds of uh, schemes. The first is the normalization and activation. Normalization, normalization, normalization. Uh, they also uh, use the very standard way of normalization, which is RLU, uh, very, uh, RLU and activation uh, in, in this paper. And uh, another scheme that the block contains is the convolutional field uh, layers. So there are two kinds of convolutional field uh, layers. Uh, the first one is the regular one and the other one is the dilated one. But for scheme B, for block B, it only contains uh, dilated ones. And lastly, it contains a skip connection uh, over here, which was also the blue line uh, in the previous figure two. This is the skip connection. Oh, sorry. And then let's, uh, Let's check out these two uh, residue blocks. Uh, we, we can see that the one a major difference that they also apply here is that is is adding a one times one a regular filter for transformation purpose in block A compared to block B, and this results in the formula of uh, the formula of uh, the the formula of the residue mapping here, uh, given here, the first line is the formula for block A, and the second line is the formula for block B. Uh, you, you don't need to be scared by this uh, seemingly very very long uh, formula. It's very easy to understand if you 
look at this formula from inside out, uh, you can see that it's nothing but going through this block from bottom to up. So this uh, psi here means uh, layer optimization. And the, the sigma here is the RELU optimization. Uh, W1 and W3 are the convolution weight function. And the W2, W2 prime and W4 prime means the dilated convolution filter. So it's basically just stacking this, uh, this block one by one and put it in, into the formula. So, uh, so why, why did they also propose this one times one uh, transformation filter? Uh, it's, uh, it, it seems to make it more complicated, but if we work out the math, we can find that it's, it's making it more efficient because uh, if you calculate the number of parameters, you can see that uh, for block A, the number of uh, parameter is uh, one times one times 2K times 2K uh, plus here, over here we have uh, one times three times K times K. And lastly, we plus one times one plus uh, times K times 2K. So in this case, in total, we have seven K square of parameters. And in this case, let's check out this. Uh, note that here we are checking the, we are, we are going through the number of parameters for each, uh, for each uh, dilated filter instead of for the entire block. So, uh, so we have one times three times two k times two k, which makes which makes it uh, twelve k square. So we can see that after having this uh, one times one uh, layer of regular layer of transformation, we are reducing the number of parameters by five k square. So that's the major uh, purpose of having it here. Uh, I think now I've finished the uh, the network and the model part of of this work. Is there any okay, question? Okay, so um, if we go back to the other con uh, contribution slide, I, I hope all of you can follow um, the 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 innovations that this paper ports uh, from the visionary, uh, uh, which Shinza wrote on one of the slides that. Uh, you know, there's the idea of using the dilated convolution, um, which is from the WaveNet paper um, that I put in Slack. Um, then the use of the uh, residual network, which is from ResNet, uh, another famous paper in, in Vision. That was from the Microsoft team. And, and then the third part was to use 1D convolutions over 3D convolutions to save parameters. That is also um, seen from vision papers as well. So um, just for, for those of you in the CS6101 uh, PhD cohort, it, it really does pay uh, help to pay attention to uh, literature um, outside of your area, especially upstream. So for, for a lot of us in applications, I mean, paying attention to machine learning papers from iClear or, or NIPS, it's a good way to predict what might happen if you're doing uh, what I call research fast, which is chasing the, the latest local models of, of how to do things. So this, this particular paper is putting together a couple of the innovations from vision and then porting it over to the recommendation systems. Mm. Okay, so yeah, that, why don't we go on because we're out of time. So yeah, uh, I understand. Let's go to the experiments. Yeah. Let's go to the experiment part. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so for the model comparisons, uh, there's basically three main models, which is the authors model, next IT net, the RNN base model, GRU rec, also uh, the previous CNN base model, which is KZ. And there's also the naive model, which just returns the most popular items of the data set every time. So like um, context-based like sequential recommendation models are omitted because like this current model is also not context-based. Um, so the data sets used are the buying data set YOO and like music data set from last FN. So how pre-processing is done is that 
for the raw sessions, they extract sequences into five different types of data sets. So like each, each type will have a different window length. So for example, Music M5 has a window length of five. Music M10 has a window length of 10, etc. So for the sub-sessions data set, they extract sub-sessions which are required to model item interdependencies uh, with padding and removing of N indices, like uh, which was mentioned just now. So this is called uh, sub-session optimization. And if you see this arrow here, it basically um, shows the, like how, how they do data augmentation to uh, try to model this item interdependencies. But results have shown that it is still uh, sub-optimal -optim with this optimization. Yep. So next I'll be sharing the top end accuracy metrics that they have used. So they have used three metrics. One is the mean re reciprocal rank metric. So what they do is they average the reciprocal ranks and they set it to zero if the rank is above 20. So for example, if the item is ranked 25, then one over 25 becomes zero. And the range of this metric is zero to one with one being the best. And the next metric is the heat ratio. So it's the proportion of relevant items. For example, if the user clicks on this item or this song that coincide with the top end recommendations. So it ranges from zero to one as well with one being the best as well. And the last metric is the normalized, discounted and cumulative gain. Yeah, so I'll explain this in the next slide. So N is set to five and 20 uh, in the results, yeah. So for the NDCG metric, uh, you first have to define the relevant scores. And uh, this is basically an example of, like, uh, there's a order of recommendation relevant scores and an order of an ideal relevant scores. So like uh, these relevant scores are used like reciprocal ranks. So uh, CG just means cumulative gain and you simply add up the array, but it does not, uh, but this score does not account for the order. So that's when this counting comes in. So the, if you see on the right, the, de the denominator represents this counting. So the high weightage is given more to the front. So example, uh, high weightage is given to top songs of the playlist uh, rather than the, yeah, so basically high weightage is given to the top songs of the playlist. Yeah, and uh, that's for DCG. And for IDCG, uh, you basically normalize it with the ideal DCG score. So you basically uh, do 0 0.984 divided by 1667 to get 0 0.590. So that's how you get NDCG. And the, like I've also like given links in this tree uh, for you to read up more as well. Um, for the results summary, so basically it's firstly shown that the three neural models has promising accuracy in top end sequential recommendation tasks. So it perf performs more than 120 times better than the naive model. And the best, uh, MRR, which is the mean reciprocal rank result achieved for next IT net model is 0 0.3233. So this means that the desired item is ranked position three on average among 20,000 candidate items. And this next IT net model also largely outperforms KZN and GRU uh, which I'll explain in the next few slides. So the advantages of this next IT net model is that it takes advantages of leveraging complete sequential information, while the other two does not have such full utilization, even with sub-session optimization. Um, yeah, so as mentioned just now, the other two models model like the single conditional probabilities for this next IT model, like models uh, the, the full, like uh, it uses all conditional probabilities for the joint distribution, yeah. And as also mentioned, there were no pooling layers. So what having no pooling layers does is that it preserves the whole spatial resolution of the original embedding matrix E without any information loss. And lastly, it supports deeper layers with residual le learning. So Kazer was a shallow network and deeper networks are better suited for modeling complicated relations and long-term dependencies.
So in terms of the training time, uh, CNN-based models require less training time in comparison to RNN models like GRU rec because of parallelism. And uh, there's also a further improvement in training time in comparison to K0 because of this, uh, because again, it leveraged complete sequence and therefore there will be faster convergence. Um, so in conclusion, it's simple. The model is simple, efficient, and highly effective uh, for session-based top-end item recommendations. So it serves as a generic method for modeling both short and long-range session-based recommendations. So other, the other two models do not model long-range item interdependencies as effective. So this, this is just a recap. Like the four main contributing features of the model is that it's CNN-based. It combines mask filters with 1D dilated convolutions. Uh, there's residual learning. And it explicitly models all conditional probabilities rather than single conditional probabilities. Uh, so on the last row, uh, it says that it only works best for data sets with strong sequential property. So if you see the quick start uh, notebook on our first slide, uh, we can see that the model does not do well for the Amazon data set because it does not have this uh, strong sequential property assumption. So in their future work, they also mentioned to incorporate additional contextual information. And this model has the flexibility to do so uh, as seen on the bottom image. Yeah, so it's basically done by combining U and P by element-wise operations like addition, multiplication, or concatenation. Um, yeah, so that's all from our group. Thank you for the present. Uh, thank you, and any questions? Okay. Thanks, uh, Zijin, uh, Shinza, and Quan Hao for presenting. Um, we are a bit out of time, and I'm sorry, I have to run off to another appointment. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, we're transitioning to the second half of the course now. So uh, those of you, especially for our undergraduates who are staying with us for the entire semester, that's great. But for uh, the three of you in 6101 uh, part one, uh, we hope to hear from you um, next week uh, for the last session, even though that's technically the start of your next lab rotation. Uh, so I hope uh, that particular group will be able to update us uh, how things are going. Okay. Um, I will uh, give you more instructions on the projects channel later about uh, the slide deck that you guys need to populate for uh, next week's uh, meeting. Okay, so thanks very much. So uh, two weeks from now, we'll have uh, the team responsible for week nine do the first session for conversational recommendation systems, combining both areas together. Okay, thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Take care.